That's the simple reason. Good afternoon. I'm not going to use uh, the microphone. I think most of you know I can project pretty well. Welcome to the new faculty senators, and welcome to those of you who have been in faculty senate for a while. I want to have if I'm remiss on missing anybody, uh, because some of the names just came in yet this week. Those of you who are new faculty members, uh, faculty senators, do not have a nameplate. We'll rectify that for our next meeting in September. But right now we just want to say welcome to you. Um, the first item on our agenda is to announce any proxy or alternates. The proxies that I have received are Kwame Aguaman for Alicia Latham. Suresh Rai for Adoran Boulder, Brian McCann for Chris Barrett, Blake Wilson for Rodrigo Diaz, Kathy Williams for Brett Collier, and Kathy Williams for Kristen Stair. Are there other alternates or proxies that need to be announced? Okay, thank you. The next item is to make sure that you have signed the role, both as guests or as properties or as faculty senators. And our next item then is to have an introduction of guests. And Michael, I'll let you start. Sure. Uh, Michael Luke's Director, Environmental Health and Safety. And I'm Patrick Martin, Assistant Vice President for Real Estate Public Partnerships and Compliance. Thomas Glenn with the Student Systems Modernization Project. I'm Bob Hammerick, from the College of Human Sciences and Education. Jane Anthony, Vice Provost of Academic Affairs. Brian Landry, Staff Academic Affairs. Brian Anthony, Associate Registrar. Ashley Arsenault, Strategic Communications in the President's Office. I'm actually just yeah. over here. <laughs> Next item, uh, because we do recognize it. Members of the public may have comments on the specific agenda items. Susanna, have we received any no, any uh, requests for that? No. Okay. I have not either, so there will, will be no public comments. That. Uh, the next item is approval or revision of the May 1st minutes, which were sent to you. We usually approve the minutes based upon any minor corrections, typographical errors, name misspellings, those type things. Are there other major items that need correction in the minutes? Do I hear a motion to accept the minutes then with any minor corrections we add later? Dr. Azagare, Dr. Williams second. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed no. Any abstentions? All right, thank you very much. Um, the next item is the president's report, and I'm going to defer that so that the president of the university, Dr. King Alexander, can speak to us and welcome us to campus and give us some insight on some of the major things that are happening on campus as well. Thank you, Ken, and welcome back, everybody. Uh, I just wanted to come on and just give you an update uh, on a number of things uh, since graduation. The, the legislature eventually ended the, their, the, the great battle between 40% and 50% of a penny. Um, and they settled for 44.5% of the penny being returned for the next seven years. Um, the, whole, the, last, the last three weeks up until June 22nd, it was about that last fraction. And, uh, number of people, a number of leaders didn't want the governor to get the full half penny. They wanted to say they stopped him from getting the full half penny. And so the, the end result was the 44.5% of the penny. Uh, and that, that's the same penny that had a two-year sunset. That, that was a two-year sunset clause on that penny, which ended June 30th. Uh, the governor did, reduced it already by half, so he knocked it down to half a penny. And the remaining three weeks of the legislative session was about that half of a penny and that very small percentage of a penny. Um, they argued about 
they could have made that decision on February 19th when they first met because that was what was debated on February 19th. Uh, so, but what that ended up doing is that ended up getting enough, generating enough revenues so TOPS got fully funded so our students, and that's important to us because 15,000 of our 26,000 undergraduates are on TOPS. And it was only funded at 70%, which would have been about a, about a $2,500 extra bill for our students if they hadn't resolved that issue. It also eliminated the 12 to 15% cut that we were looking at as an institution, uh, allowing us to move forward and uh, do what we needed to do to address fixed costs, mandated costs, and to go forward with our plan with the 3% salary increase. So this will be the second year we've been able to try to get back on track to where we were. We've got a long way to go. Uh, we've dropped a lot since 2008 and that decade, that dark decade that we lived through. Most of you lived through all of it. It's, this has been about five and a half years for me. Uh, but these last two years have given us the stability to do some things. Our enrollment growth this year has also helped us generate the revenues necessary to make some adjustments that we made. Uh, this is the largest freshman class in our history. Uh, overall, we've, we're fluctuating. We're fluctuate, fluctuating between an about overall enrollment about 500 to 100 up uh, but as a freshman class we're about 800 up from where we are we're approaching 6,000 freshmen it's the most diverse freshman class we've ever had in our history it's a little more out of state than what we've had in the past last year we were about 82 percent in state this year we're about 79 percent in state but we have a lot more students from a lot more places. We're up about 200% on California freshmen, New York, New Jersey freshmen, states that we norm traditionally haven't recruited, but uh, we started recruiting last year, and it's paying, paying off for us. The Nicholson Gateway, the 1,600 apartments are for upperclassmen, so we can have, we'll have, we have more students on campus and hopefully less students driving. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> And because it's far more inconvenient to drive from there than it is to walk from there. Uh, the Mathern's grocery store, if you haven't been in, is really a, a nice addition for the campus. Uh, the left half of it is, is deli, uh, salad bars, uh, lunch dinner bars, breakfast bars, uh, hot meals. Uh, the right half of it is groceries, and each one of these apartments has a kitchenette in it, and, and they're, they're, they're nicer than any apartments that are off campus. And you're seeing a lot of the apartments off campus dropping their pricing because students are flocking in here, which we're about 88% full, and we just have more students on campus. And it's the first year we've mandated that all freshmen live on campus with some local exemptions and some other pretty, pretty flexible exemptions for students that, that have various needs for various reasons. So we're off, and this is the, the first year that, that when, with the budget solved like it is, Two years ago, we were looking at a $2 billion budget deficit when we started the academic year at the state level. Last year, we were looking at a $1 billion deficit that was going to kick in June 30th. This year, there is no deficit, and the only discussion going on right now is how we can get more capital funds to help, us help our deferred maintenance on campus and how we can actually start putting some money back into higher education on, on behalf of the state. And you'll hear a lot more about that as the year goes on. So this is the best start we've had. The faculty cohort coming in is a, our best faculty cohort in the six years I've been here. Um, it's 157 new faculty. Last year was the largest faculty cohort we had had in the previous five years. It was 133 new faculty. We've all lived through the years where we were all, we were we had about 70 to 75 percent of our faculty retiring and we were only able to bring back about 20 to 45 during those years. So this new group of faculty, 157 new faculty on the back of 133 new faculty coming to us from everywhere, uh, about a third of them are from southeastern states, two thirds of them from all over the, all over the globe, but also primarily three fourths of that group from, from, what state, from University of Washington, UCLA. We get two from Wisconsin, two from Michigan, Yale. They're coming to us from all over, which says that our our, our reputation is still strong as a university, despite that, dec that dark decade that we went through. Uh, so welcome our new faculty. It is a great cohort. Uh, I have no doubt when the numbers come in that this will, get, uh, this will start pushing our numbers back to a, 
where we were as a student to faculty ratio, not where we have been, uh, which is going to help with our classroom sizes as well. Uh, you're in the building, the foundation building. We're going to have a public announcement of the capital campaign, which most likely will be a $1.5 billion announcement, uh, which is the largest campaign in Louisiana's history and certainly LSU's. Uh, we're well above where we should be at this point with about $500 million already raised and we are anticipating that we might even be able to blow through that $1.5 in the next five to six years, or $1.5 billion within the next five to six years. So that's, that's what you're going to hear a lot about in the spring as we move forward with the capital campaign, the public phase of the capital campaign. And all of these things are going to be happening this year. There's a bunch of new restaurants on campus uh, for our engineering faculty and business faculty. I know Panera is now open and apparently it's a pretty big hit with students and everybody there because it has coffee, <laughs> <laughs> among, among things. But we got a lot of new restaurants and opened up uh, Spruce, our new residential, residential college, uh, just on the other side of Cyprus. And when we open the third one up in that area, we'll be able to bring Kirby Smith down in 2020, which will implode Kirby Smith, and we have donors who want to buy those bricks. For what reason, I don't know. <laughs> it's, 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 the last, it's the last of our high-rises, I think. That, that they've even eliminated the high-rises in the south side of Chicago because they're hard to create communities in them. Uh, but that's kind of, it's, we're off to a great start, and I thank everybody for the, your support and faculty just that something about this entering class just be cognizant of it's it's more diverse uh, it's much 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 larger underrepresented population uh, and it's our largest Pell low-income population and there are rumors from other universities that we had to get students and this is for various reasons we've heard this rumor that we lowered our standards actually our average grade point average great GPA went up from 3.56 to 3.64 of this entering class. The ACT stayed exactly where it was at its highest level at 25.5. But there are those trying to say in, in order to increase the enrollment of underrepresented students, we had to lower something. That's not true at all. These are high achieving students with high capacity. The only difference that we made in, in our enrollment program is that we went to holistic enrollment which means we look at students' portfolios now. We don't just look at two numbers, which is an ACT and a grade point average. We look at more than that. And if a student is, has a 2-9 but had a terrible freshman year, happens to be president of this, the high school student government, or won the community service award of the high school, we're going to take these things into account. And it's important that we do because we're actually in the minority because we didn't. And we are in the minority, there are only three SEC schools that do not look at a holistic portfolio of what a student looks like over their past four years. And it's Mississippi State, Arkansas, and Alabama. Every one of the Big Ten schools uses holistic enrollment except for Iowa. And the entire UCs are on holistic enrollment, as is the Ivy League, as is the vast majority of, of Research One public universities nationwide. We owe it to our students to take a good look at what they've accomplished over the last four years. And generally, students who only get one crack at the ACT aren't the ones who have had prep classes, aren't the ones who know exactly the significance and importance of it, are generally lower income students who only get one shot at it, uh, who don't have coaches and private tutors and take it four or five times or take it as an eighth grader because your parents talked you into doing it early. Uh, this gives us a much broader look and much broader view of the capacity of our new incoming students. So we're pleased with this class, uh, but know that they're going to need a little more help being on, certainly because it is the largest Pell Grant population we've ever had, which also means that we're, once again, we play an important role in this social mobility uh, movement. That, that's why we're here. And this, if we succeed with this class, we're going to have a lot of naysayers that were out there that are going to that, are, that we'll be able to shut up because this is the best opportunity they have to graduate from this university as opposed to any other university in the state. So we appreciate the work everybody's doing, and um, we hope some of these new amenities will keep everybody on campus more. 
uh, and look forward to seeing you on campus. Having said that, I'll, I'll take any questions you might have for me. Ken, if that's okay. Absolutely. But before you ask questions, I'm going to publicly acknowledge President Alexander for what he did for us this summer at the Board of Supervisor meeting where there was a lot of discussion about fees. He stuck his neck out for us. And when I say he stuck his neck out for over two hours, he stuck his neck out for us. And that's why we got raised. So I want you to join me in acknowledging Dr. Alexander for taking care of us this year. I blame those extra two hours on the fact that we picked up two lawyer, two more lawyers on the board, <laughs> a board of supervisors. <laughs> and speaking of that, we do have a lot of new members on the board of supervisors. So when you have an opportunity to interact with them, as some of you occasionally do, kind of educate them about why we're here at LSU and what the faculty does to make this a great place and how we bend over backwards to help our students succeed. Because that will go a long ways then towards us having a cohesive front when we go downtown to the legislature, when we talk to the Board of Regents and those type of things. So any questions for Dr. Alexander? Yes, yes sir. Fred. Could you please uh, clarify, we have 157 new faculty. How many, what is the net gain? How many we lost, how many we So not knowing the exact number of how many we had retired, we average our retirement or departure is about 70 to 75 a year. Uh, and we were coming in as a net loss on a number of those years of about 35 each year, 35 or 40. I uh, know one year we only hired 24 and we lost about 75. So we've more than doubled. The net gain is going to be in right 80-ish, 80-ish number. Thank you. And I appreciate the work everybody did because I know all of you were on those search committees. And, and it, it's, it's hard trying to talk somebody to come to Louisiana when all you've read about for year in and year out are budget reductions, the state's in disarray, can't get its act together. That's a hard thing to do. But it's, it's also, it, it's, I mean, the bond rating actually just went back up. So any, any, any groups, any, any committees you're on that are looking for faculty, um, the Provost Search Committee started yesterday. I think it's a, it's a great time to, to be either on that committee or being recruiting to LSU because we've never been in better fiscal shape. And we're not, we're not looking at a deficit. We're not talking about cuts. We're talking about growth. We're talking about what we can do in, in the future. Which is, which is good for your search committees this, this coming year. Should help us externally as well. No other questions? Wow. Yes, Juan. So, uh, thank you very much for your report. Um, so, with this historically larger, more diverse uh, incoming freshman class or arrived freshman class, um, is there sort of a, a tuition freeze or is there a proposed increase in those tuitions to actually generate more revenue? So we, unlike any other university in the country or any other state, we have to have a two-thirds vote to raise tuition from the state legislature. So tuition's out of our control. Uh, two years ago, we wrestled fee authority away from the state for, th for a three-year period. We have fee authority for one, one more year. Um, we're going to be fighting to retain that and hang on to that. We went up on fees about really about 4.95 percent was the same thing we did last year uh, we had to first of all because we had about eight million dollars we had to cover in just mandated costs on retirement uh, energy the same things that go up that we have no control over uh, but the fee authority does still exist uh, we put nine million new dollars into student financial aid of which we now put in about 27 million dollars of our own aid uh, for these students. Um, we've taken a, a careful look at each income quartile to see how much each student actually is paying. And for, the, for those 15,000 students coming in, either low income or, or uh, which most of our Louisiana kids had to have a 3-0 to get in so they qualified for TOPS, uh, most of those lowest income students aren't paying anything. The average TOPS recipient, when you take TOPS out, when you're not factoring in room and board, which you have to do somewhere, anywhere, uh, 
when you're not factoring in room and board, we just calculated, and we're going to show the Board of Supervisors, that the average Louisiana student on tops, when you add our financial aid, uh, is paying about $800 a semester in tuition and fees. Now, the room and board is, is, is the living conditions that they, that probably some loan money goes to, but that's one reason why only about 38% of our students graduates with any debt, undergrad, and the national average is 82%. So our students, with the amount of aid we put on the table, we've never put this much aid, both in merit and in need, because the Pelican Promise covers the need Pell Grant students, which basically makes it free for our Pell students. Um, the merit aid has never been rosier for us, and that's one reason why we're up 53% in out-of-state students, because we decided to start playing, playing the same game that everybody else is, pouring money into a lot of students who are high achieving and bringing those students and competing with, with a lot of other out-of-state out institutions that you've heard a lot about. Now, one thing we haven't done that I don't think we're ever going to get to that point, Alabama has been throwing a lot of merit money around, and you've heard all the stories, the anecdotal stories, but Alabama's freshman class is only 31% from Alabama. South Carolina now is only 38% from South Carolina. And we've watched their African-American numbers drop from 17% to 7%. And what they're doing is trading a lot of their local in-state kids for kids from New York and New Jersey and South Carolina. And our number at 79% is still, our commitment is still strong to our Louisiana kids. Uh, we're just bringing in a disproportionately larger number of out-of-state kids to help subsidize our in-state kids because our state isn't doing it. Um, but we're not going to get to the point where we're doing what Alabama is, which is basically abandoning this, the, the in-state kids. And we're going to try to use that to our advantage with our state legislature also. Because I always hear the story about the, the high-achieving kid in their hometown who got a ton of money dumped on him to go to Arkansas or Alabama. Uh, that is true, and that's why those, those institutions are in the 30s when it comes to serving their own in-state students. So our numbers, actually, the, the amount of aid has never been better. Um, our lowest income kids are protected on the tuition and fees. Uh, it's room and board and just living conditions. Uh, it's it's where, where they can get help through the federal government on um, room and board through a subsidized loan, SEOG grants, other things that, that can factor into the equation. Any other last questions for Dr. Alexander? All right. Welcome back, everybody. Off Thank to you good start. Much. Thanks, Kim. I'm also going to yield for a couple of minutes so our senior vice provost, Dr. Cassidy, uh, can welcome us on behalf of our interim provost who is off fundraising. <laughs> and when she said, I hate to miss the faculty senate meeting, I said, I know what your priority is. <laughs> Bring us money. <laughs> so she's off doing that. So Dr. Cassidy. Thank you, Ken. Uh, Yes, she wants to welcome all of you here. I think she met with you all in May. Uh, so she has been in office now for three or four months and uh, hit the ground running and has been very busy. Wanted me to share three of her things that she has been focusing on. One is recruitment. And uh, President Alexander has already told you we've got the largest uh, freshman class coming in, the most diverse class uh, coming in. And a lot of that was due to holistic admissions and Jose Avila's shop en enrollment and admissions did a fabulous job. But she also wanted me to thank those of you, and I know a number of you were involved in that recruiting process as we bring uh, high achieving students to campus. A number of them were meeting with faculty members. That's been a big push now because we know that students come to the university because of the, academic, uh, of the academics at the university. Um, it used to be not, not that the uh, student rec center and all those things aren't important, but the number one reason that they come is to work with, uh, with faculty members. So thank you for those of you that were involved in that process. Second thing that she's been focused on is retention. And when you get a big group of uh, students who are diverse and, and from different backgrounds, uh, we are going to uh, need to have a few different strategies to make sure that our students who come here are successful. And I think if you hear Stacey Haney talk, the one thing that she says is that every student that comes here, we should we should graduate because they're all capable because they were admitted. And there are a couple of things she wanted me to pass along to you that you can do and that you can have your colleagues do 
Uh, number one is to make sure that you are assessing early in the semester. Because many of the students who get here, especially students from uh, backgrounds where maybe they have, uh, have families who have not gone to college, maybe they're first generation students. Uh, being a student at college, even if they've been high achieving in the high school, doesn't always, as we know, doesn't always translate. So that first test they take with you is a very important gauge for them as to what it's going to be like to take a test in college. So if you can assess them early, that's very important. Second thing is to make sure that everybody gives midterm grades. We have about 40% compliance on that. Only about 40% of the undergraduate courses get their midterm grades turned in. These kids really need, not just, not just the freshmen, but other students too, need to have that halfway mark for themselves so that they can dig themselves out if they need to. So, um, and, oh, the other one is to just make sure that you know the services that are available to the students who are struggling. Uh, make sure that you know where the Center for Academic Success is. Make sure that you know the social services for, um, for the SSS um, program, where those are. Uh, and if you need any advice on that, or if you don't know where those are, you can look on our Academic Affairs website, and there's a whole list of those for students. So you can watch out for students. Make sure that you know how to get in touch with LSU CARES. For students who might not be attending class, you might notice that somebody's been there for a couple of weeks and now all of a sudden they've dropped off the radar. If we can just keep, uh, you know, keep the support services for these students, we will have a much higher retention rate. And that's what we're, that's what we're trying to do. The third thing that she's been focused on is online. Uh, we are expanding our portfolio of options for people who want to get an LSU degree, both degrees and certificates. Uh, and you may know that we've worked with academic programs in the past and we are now going to transition to doing that in-house. We think we can do a better job with that. If you haven't met Sasha Thackerberry, sometime you will see her. She's very impressive and she is running that shop right now. On top of that, when we use uh, academic programs, uh, we pay them 50% of the tuition and so we won't have to do that anymore. So it's in our best, our best interest to do that. One of the things that we will get from having an, uh, an employee um, a uh, new group of people in the online programs is the university will, will um, get financial benefit from that. But one of the <coughs> messages that Stacy is giving out and uh, Sasha also gives out is that the number one issue with all of this is the quality of the degree. That will not be sacrificed just to bring in additional money. So Sasha is uh, working hard with employing some instructional designers who are helping get all these things up online so that customer service is good for these students and so that the LSU degree means an LSU degree. It's not just a University of Phoenix or some other non, uh, nonprofit. So um, I think that's about it with that. And my last thing that I would just like to say is thank you. Last time I spoke to you, we were talking about PS36. And Thank goodness, it is now checked off and President Alexander signed it about a month ago, it's online, and you will notice that all of the comments that you all made were incorporated into the document. Uh, if you remember, one of the big things that we talked about was the academic freedom, which has now become a, an appendix there, and Ken and I are, are working on getting that into its, its own separate policy, and it will be soon. So, we can all breathe a sigh of relief. The current one is now online for you and your colleagues to look at. So, thank you, welcome back. Thank you. If, I, if I could just comment on the retention issue, uh, it's even more important when 80% of our funding is coming from our students, retention is even a, is a bigger, it becomes even a bigger issue. But more importantly, the greatest tragedy in American higher education is the student who started but never finished. And that's half of the students in American higher education. And there are two reasons. One is that they didn't just go to work, they've, gone, they've, hit, they've acquired foregone earnings losses. But more importantly, most of them have acquired student loan debt without any benefit. And the earnings capacity of a college dropout is virtually no different now than a high school graduate who never pursued college in the first place. So the great tragedy that we're seeing around the country are the students who started but never finished. They assumed some of the debt. They, they weren't able to get the job they wanted. And they never got a piece of paper. Or they ended up getting a worthless piece of paper from some of those other online universities, for-profit universities. Who, who have no quality programs and they never get a job from them. So our students, in loco parentis is alive and well and we need to treat it like that. And we owe it to these students to help them every way possible to succeed. Because what, what they face if they don't is, is worse and worse every year. So I appreciate everybody's consideration in, in, on that topic and issue each and every day. Yeah, 
and now we have questions. Yeah, and along those lines, and this might be for you or for Dr. Cassidy, I've noticed a higher and higher visibility of the Center for Academic Success among the students. They, they know more, more of them know about it now than even two years ago. They're accessing it. Are there further plans to help that keep moving in a very positive direction? Because I think it's moving in a positive direction. Yeah. Uh, about CAS and our, and, our, and our emphasis, we've even, you want to just tell them what we've done and moved it and... <coughs> Sure, we've, we've expanded it. Melissa Mercado is, is overseeing it along with um, Gloria Thomas. Um, they've hired more people to do the um, to do the tutoring. Uh, we've expanded the space in the bottom of Coates Hall and also in the library. So there's much more space for them to do what they need to do because of what you're saying is the influx of students. And we've moved it into academic affairs too. Oh, yeah, so, uh, right. and because it was just living on whatever money they can generate. And now we're giving it a stable budget, a growing budget, and the student numbers are growing. And something else we did the first week of school on Bingle Bound, we brought all the freshmen in a week before. Normally we bring them in about two days before, and then they start classes while they're trying to find where they're supposed to be or find these support services. And then we set up programs for them all through the first week on where to go, where to find help, when to need, and I have to say, it, it for a first year, it was a remarkable success in the, the amount of student involvement and things we did at night, and it could have been things, finding financial aid office, finding the CAS, finding knowing where to go, and walking them in, showing them what happens, all the way to taking them to Target at 10 o'clock at night. <laughs> so Target shut down, and we took 2,000 students to Target from 10 o'clock to 1 a.m. And Target thought it was Black Friday all over. <laughs> and, and, but it was a, that first week was a great success that we're going we're gonna to do again next year because normally all this stuff happens while they're trying to adjust to their classes and it, it, it's just much more difficult for students to make that transition without that first week and that's what we said. What Academic Affairs is also doing, and they don't want it too public so I'm telling you to kind of keep it on the QT, but we have algorithms where we identify our more at-risk students who are coming. And so academic affairs has actually divided those into groups and various of our higher administrators. I'm not talking about deans, I'm talking about the, at the academic affairs level actually meet with those students every week and so that there's a face of the university with those at-risk students so they know that we do care about them and their success. And that's a huge step in helping to keep those at-risk students, one, on track, but two, if all of a sudden we see that they're falling off the mark, then to guide them in the right direction. And that's really what's going to make or break our retention, I think, in the next couple of years is how we handle those students, both administratively as well as faculty members. I think so one of the those are the things that are going on. Right. Just to add to that. Stacy believes that the retention is all of our problem, all of our not problem, all of our opportunity, mm -hmm. and the upper administration needs to own a piece of that. And so this welcome week that uh, that the president said we were very involved at the at the senior faculty at the senior executive level as our piece of that, and now we hand them off to the classes. So it's, it's <coughs> imperative that all of us own that. And, and that's the, that's the grounds crew. That's campus police. Right senior faculty, my office, it, this is everybody's issue. And a safer place, creating a safe environment, learning environment, a place they want to be on campus more, it's, this is everybody's responsibility. Ali. Thank you. Uh, I'm thinking of online enrollment as um, a chance for retention, in addition, of course, to creating additional revenue. So what, what is the size of online enrollment? that we anticipate, say, in the coming five years, and are we getting ready for that? What is the status now? Should we, every unit start preparing for this, and us, me as a faculty, get ready to learn how to <coughs> professionally do online uh, teaching? That's a great question. Uh, not every unit right now that wants to have an online degree is going to, we don't have the resources for that. So they're going to start with the ones that have the biggest market, uh, the ability to bring in the biggest students are going to stand up. Um, I believe construction management already has an online degree, so that's going to be redone in the LSU way. It's going to be moved from academic programs to us. 
is also a, a bachelor in BIS, interdisciplinary studies, uh, which is marketed for students who have not completed a degree here at LSU and have left and come back and still have some courses to take so that they can actually complete a degree. Uh, and so those are the two that are being worked with, worked on right now. I don't know, President, is there a, a target number? Um, so, I, you know, I, th I think we're fully capable once we get this ramped up of having 35,000 students on campus and 35 off. And right now, three-fourths of all our online students are not in Louisiana. Uh, they're all over the country and international. Um, I, I, but then there's also our, as far as the retention issue, a lot of our, a lot of our on-campus students, uh, our daughter goes here and she's taking three on-campus and one online course to get her 12 credit hours. And our older daughter, her older, uh, our older daughter, and just graduated from Wisconsin this summer, went through the graduation in, the, in May, but took two online courses to get everything completed over the summer, so her degree was finalized over the summer. So it can help the students who are here with, with more options for the retention issue, but there are a lot of, there, those 35,000 other students we're talking about are students who are not going to come here. That, Dr. Zuckerberry will come talk to us in, at our October meeting, I believe, but in between times we communicate off and on, and her two major goals are one, so we have what I would call standard templates for online courses so that there's some consistency so that when they take online courses for a degree, it's not, well, this course is operated this way and another course is operated another way. It, it's kind of like we develop our curriculum, so she's very cognizant of that. The second thing is she knows that we want even higher standards at LSU than we ever have had, and she's building that into the online courses. That means that some of our continuing ed courses and some of our current online courses are going to have to be revised and revamped so that they meet the standards that we as a faculty set because we determine educational policy. So I, I'm not worried in the least about our online programs at this point in time. I, I may change my mind, but right now, Dr. Thackerberry has, she's moved us forward so far already that there's no reason to think that we're not going to continue. We got her from Southern New Hampshire University, uh, who has about 95% of their students, 99% of their students aren't in New Hampshire. Uh, and, and in many ways, you know, we've, we've done this to ourselves. We've abdicated this responsibility of helping all these other students by allowing these for-profit uh, pirates uh, to, to, to steal federal money, to throw students into massive debt, and to give them worthless degrees. When, if we, when we can do it with high quality, and this is my friend Michael Crow at Arizona State, is, is, he, he, he flipped with me about 10 years ago, hey, why aren't we doing this, allowing Phoenix and allowing all these other pirates to get away with what they're doing when a lot of people need online education, especially quality online education from reputable universities, not like the University of the United States of America, <laughs> which exists, John F. Kennedy University in San Francisco which is getting sued by the Kennedys for using their name. Wow. Um, <laughs> there, yes. All right. Uh, yeah, I appreciate all the information you've given us. Could you please give, shed some light on our graduate program, graduate school? So that's a graduate education has been, it's been somewhat of a mystery for the last five or six years. When, when we should have increased, normally graduate education grows and expands when economies are bad. And they, they slowly decrease when economies are good because people can get jobs and they're not out of jobs. Um, ours has been relatively flat to going nowhere. And we really need to get back to the numbers that we used to have. And that includes international numbers as well. And that's a little more difficult environment because we're, um, we're dealing with whatever got tweeted between the last time I started talking and now. Um, and what group got alienated in that time period. Um, but we need to build our international graduate enrollment, and we also need to build, and we're going to tackle that issue. That is a top priority and a weakness that we have right now. And are we competitive with our grad assistantships? I know we put more money, and let the deans put more money into it, but is it enough? Is it working? Uh, are we competitive with what we're offering these grad students? And, and are we getting word to them? Two years ago, we had 
couple hundred grad students we didn't even respond to. So they applied. We didn't even tell them, we didn't tell them yes or no. They just didn't hear from us. So that we really have got a lot of work to do with our with our grad our our grad grad students and our grad college. So and we're we know it. Are we doing a lot across campus with online in our graduate programs like ours? So is that a way that we're balancing or bringing more So a lot, so a lot, they will probably have a disproportionate amount of online courses that are grad, right. certificate related, grad master's related courses that people need, yep. who are working people, uh, working adults. Uh, uh, actually one of our, our, our best online is LSU Shreveport right now. They have almost 3,000. Half their enrollment is online from all over the world. And they had a student graduate and flew into the graduation from the Congo this year. Uh, so there's great disproportionate amount. Those that are marketable tend to be at least half grad programs, half undergrad, but half grad programs and certificates, flexible certificate programs for companies and other things like that. Speaking of that, Dr. Thackerberry is also working with the other campuses like Shreveport that have what I would call more highly developed online programs, courses and programs, <coughs> so that we have an integrated front across the, our entire university with all the campuses. So that she's also working in that regard. I don't, I don't know when she gets all the time to do all the things that she does, but she does. That also eliminates us from, from competing with each other. Uh, within ourselves, that we have it organized and structured in a way where each campus can take advantage of certain things, certain populations, and, and having it coordinated is very important for us. Any last questions? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank Dr. you, Alexander. Thank you, Dr. Cassidy. Thanks, Our next item is really for me to give a president's report, but Michael Hooks and Patrick Martin have been kind enough to come and give us an update. Thank you very much. On environmental health and safety, so I'm going to again allow them to go ahead because I know that Patrick in particular always has things to do. He seems to be one of our problem solvers. Uh, I've been asked to talk to you about uh, our environmental health and safety programs, uh, specifically as they relate to laboratory safety. Um, a laboratory can be considered a place of uh, observation or experimentation. Uh, we oversee research and teaching labs, so you could uh, argue that the whole campus is a type of laboratory, and uh, our programs and services kind of reach uh, to all aspects of the university. Quickly, uh, our mission statement, um, we work to uh, ensure that all faculty, staff, and students have a safe and healthy place to work. Uh, we do this uh, through uh, cooperation and relationships with said faculty, staff, and students and partnerships. Uh, we do this through assessments, inspections, training, uh, response to emergencies and incidents, corrective actions, um, again, through all levels of, of the university. One of the uh, tools that we use to uh, develop our safety programs is working with uh, committees on campus that have some relation to our safety efforts. Um, specifically, there on the slide there, our research safety committee is made up of the uh, uh, chairs of the other safety committees on campus. Uh, myself and Deborah Kepler with uh, ORED chair the committee. We meet on a quarterly basis to discuss specific research uh, related safety issues. Um, and uh, it, through that process, uh, we like to make sure that we have our finger on the pulse of what's happening on the campus uh, through these other committees. You have the IBR uh, DSC, which is our biosafety committee. 
which oversees uh, all biological work on campus. Uh, there is an uh, arm of that committee, which is our uh, high-level committee, our BSL-3 uh, advisory committee, uh, that needs to uh, have oversight of all of our high-level uh, biosafety work uh, on campus. <coughs> Radiation safety, of course, uh, IACUC and IRB for animals and human research pre self explanatory Again, uh, just a list of some of our programs and services that uh, touch parts of the laboratories on campus. Uh, we do have a lab safety program, environmental services, biological safety, uh, industrial hygiene or occupational health, uh, and chemical safety. And I'll touch uh, briefly on each of these uh, areas. Radiation <coughs> safety is uh, kind of included separate there because that's a separate department or office. Uh, they handle all radioactive material, laser safety on campus. They are not part of EHS, uh, but they're separate. Of course, we work closely together. Uh, again, we oversee all research and laboratory, uh, research and teaching uh, lab safety. Uh, we have a lab accreditation program. Uh, we use uh, routine inspections and self assessments to ensure that we have full compliance with all safety and environmental guidelines. These are both state regulations and federal regulations that oversee environmental compliance, uh, worker health and safety, workers' compensation, etc. Uh, we have a, a broad safety uh, training program for all personnel that work in labs. Uh, we uh, not only do regulatory compliance, but also push for best practices. Uh, it is our goal and motto that we believe practicing safe science is practicing good science. It's all about attention to detail. Um, and if you're focusing on, on the health and safety of your employees, you're probably focusing on other, other aspects of your research uh, as well. Environmental services. Uh, we manage uh, the impact of all university activities uh, in our local environment. Again, a lot of these uh, requirements are mandated by uh, the federal government in the state of Louisiana for the EPA and the LDEQ. Uh, specifically as it relates to laboratory work, uh, hazardous waste. Uh, we're permitted as a large quantity generator uh, of hazardous waste uh, through the state of Louisiana. Um, and we have uh, several employees that work with laboratories to collect and manage and properly dispose of uh, all of these materials. They're both hazardous and non hazardous, but they're regulated uh, waste material. We probably, uh, to give you an idea, um, we probably move, and we do this on a quarterly basis um, off the campus with a third party contractor. Uh, we probably move anywhere from 25 to 30 tons of material off campus uh, each year of this type of material that we have. This does not include solid waste or the regular garbage or recycling. Uh, we also recycle other materials that are recyclable. Biological safety, we regulate, review all research involving biological agents, so that's human, animal, plant, uh, and genetic <coughs> materials, uh, also uh, DNA uh, research as well. We do see the uh, IBR DSC, it's kind of a long name, you can call it the Biosafety Committee if you want. Um, that committee uh, approves all protocols coming from uh, sponsored programs. We do this, uh, the protocols are reviewed by the committee, uh, pending inspections. Uh, we inspect uh, each of these laboratories before their protocols uh, are approved. Industrial hygiene, or again, we call occupational health. Uh, we monitor campus environments to reduce workplace exposures to any hazardous conditions. As you might expect, we have some high hazard laboratories on campus, and we have to make sure that our faculty, staff, and students are, uh, aren't exposed to any uh, unsafe conditions. Um, we do this through ergonomic uh, workstation reviews, personal protective equipment. Uh, we can even perform real time and uh, monitoring of uh, different types of uh, hazardous uh, environments, whether it be noise, ventilation, lighting, etc. Uh, specifically, our industrial hygienist oversees our chemical fume hood inspection program. We have uh, probably around 800 labs on campus with about uh, nearly 1,000 chemical fume hoods. Uh, we inspect those uh, as a h &S on an annual basis and submit work orders to facilities. Uh, to make sure that those are maintained and are functioning correctly. Of course, we also receive uh, notices if there are problems and work to uh, facilitate those corrections. Uh, 
Uh, chemical safety, of course, uh, we manage all the hazardous materials on campus through a online uh, database. Uh, it's called EHS Assistant. We track all the chemicals on campus uh, from time of purchase to disposal. We call that cradle to grave. Uh, every container is tracked uh, when it's uh, purchased to the time it's uh, disposed of. The same uh, program also monitors all the training or lab personnel through the principal investigator and the laboratory to make sure that we have proper uh, safe teaching and research environments. We also use it to manage our waste minimization to look at where we can reduce the amount of waste that we're generating uh, as a campus uh, and, and monitor for that. So it's an important part of what we do as well. Uh, we track right now probably about 80,000 uh, individual containers through this program. Uh, as I said before, practicing safe science is good science. Uh, uh, you do this by establishing a culture of safety. Uh, to that end, uh, recently the Research Safety Committee uh, has, um, over the last course of the last year, uh, worked to review a guide that was put out by uh, APLU, Associate of Public Safety Culture or Universities. Uh, there's a link uh, uh, there on the presentation, which I think will be on the faculty senate website, so you can look at that guide. Uh, it's really large, so we spare time. Um, the Research Safety Committee broke the guide apart to its pieces uh, and developed a response uh, report uh, to kind of determine where we were at LSU in relation to what the guide's recommendations were. Um, and that uh, was presented to Office of Research and Economic Development in the Provost Office, uh, hopefully soon, if not already, uh, in the President's Office, uh, for it to be uh, rolled out to the campus. Uh, some short-term goals that we identified that will be um, put into place uh, in the very near future. Um, e &S will be specifically meeting with individual department heads uh, on campus to work with them on how we can affect the safety culture in their individual departments. Uh, we hope to establish a research safety newsletter that will go out to the community, uh, campus community to uh, uh, give resources for uh, improving safety in departments and research areas. Um, also, we want to further uh, educate faculty, staff, and students on incident reporting. Uh, we found that if we have a major loss or accident, uh, we do get that report. What we don't hear about is the near misses uh, and things of the nature. That is valuable information that we can use to improve our safety program uh, and numbers on campus. Uh, so we're going to work to to get that data in as best as possible. So. This is an exciting report. Uh, I think it's going to be beneficial uh, for us to use on campus and be able to see it rolled out soon. Um, that is briefly uh, our department and how uh, we uh, work with lab safety. And I'll take uh, good questions at this time. Yes, I'll wait. Yes. Thank you uh, for the update. Talking about safety, if I drive a little bit this way, the river road over there, yes. you see how narrow is the road, uh, the road. And we have a laboratory there, the old river model. It's mm -hmm. struggling to, to drive with 45 miles per hour there, or just pay attention to travel. People drive there so yeah. fast. So I think the speed limit, it might not be us, but some, somewhere yeah, else. You're talking about exiting river road into, into those buildings right there. Where they right, are it's, the it's, it's really difficult there. At night, also Nicholson Drive extension, the lighting is an issue. If some student, student someone yeah, crossing, right. the people coming, yeah. the driver, they don't really see them, and they are at, at a high speed. So I don't know if the speed limit need to be reduced there, and better visibility. Um, I don't know about Highland Road, now it's 25 miles per hour. I don't know if it can be 15 may block traffic, but at least there should be some alternative, like protective uh, uh, alerts for the vegetarian, um, other things. Yeah. There certainly can be improvements to be made. Uh, Highland, Nicholson, and River Road present challenges because they're uh, state and city roads, and we don't own the roads specifically. Uh, Patrick probably knows more about that than I do. Um, and we can, we're certainly working to make improvements there, but I'll note that. As far as lighting, we do a fall and spring uh, lighting survey with the uh, Student Government Association where we look to make improvements to lighting. We actually walk the campus at night, cross those streets, and, and uh, notate lights that are out or we need improvement, and we do that. Uh, we try to do it twice a year with the Student Government, so we do try to make improvements there. 
But thank you. And before you ask your question, uh, I may ask Patrick to comment, but what finance and administration is doing is also looking at the various aspects of risk on campus, whether it's risk from students, whether it's risk from faculty members, whether it's risk from our facilities, uh, whether it's risk from uh, our IT and digital electronic services. So I guess you're coming to an end with that. There's a couple more yet to do. But realistically, then because we are self-insured, if we don't know what the risk of any particular incident <coughs> happening, then we can't really predict, one, how much it's going to cost us to cover <laughs> that risk if it happens. And also, we can't then predict how much we need to keep in reserve. So if, if you want to come in a couple of minutes on that, Patrick. Sure, White. Ken. Thank you. I'm Patrick Martin. I'm Assistant Vice President for Real Estate and Public Partnerships and Compliance. Uh, for LSU, I work in the Office of Facility and Property Oversight. So there's a couple of things I can do to address uh, your question and then Ken's um, comments. Uh, one, as Michael noted, uh, Nicholson and Highland are, are, are state highways um, uh, or, or, or modern or controlled by the city parish. Nicholson Drive is in the process of being transferred over to the city parish. And once, or this, the, this little stretch of it is. And so once uh, that happens, there's a lot more flexibility for us to work with the city parish to lower speed limits and things like that. When we did our Nicholson Gateway development, I'm sure almost all of you were inconvenienced by that road work that, uh, that happened for two months during the summer. Um, uh, part of what we were doing there was institu instituting traffic calming measures. We narrowed the roadway, uh, we eliminated on-street parking, we widened the median, and collectively those things are proven uh, over time to slow people down. Now, unfortunately, we've had a couple of accidents right at the start of the semester just because everybody's getting used to the new thing. But those are things that we actively consider if we're designing improvements on campus. Uh, with regard to the specific things, you're welcome to get in touch with me and I can put you in touch with our, our planning, design, and construction team and our parking and transportation office to talk about that specific situation over near the, the old Central River. Um, studies. Um, as Ken knows, we are embarked in a, in a, in a campus-wide effort to look at uh, what they call enterprise risk management, which is to, um, uh, the idea is to save money by reducing our insurance costs, by reducing the amounts that we have to pay out uh, from our self-insured uh, plans by uh, making everybody safer so there's fewer injuries uh, that we have to pay out for. And, and, and we're looking at a broad stroke, not just a you know, ladder accidents or people tripping and falling downstairs, slipping on a wet um, hallway or something like that. That's certainly part of it, but it's also looking at, at, at risk to LSU's um, reputation, his brand identity, uh, his, um, computer security issues, um, all those kind of factors. So um, we, we are, you know, in, this, in the process of wrapping that up. And our representative, I, I've asked him to stay on even though he's a our administrator now is Dr. Van Gimmick, so he actually is working on that committee and as far as traffic safety, mobility, trolleys on campus, buses, I mean anything to do with that movement on campus, then Dr. Van Gimmick is our person. Jared, question? It's kind of like the Ali's comments, and I think one factor, one factor that he mentioned is everything that's, that's current, that's infrastructure. The other issue that we really have is with students and even with uh, you know faculty members in crosswalk. I mean that was evident last week. It was still evident this week, right? In cyclists as well. Yesterday a message went out and it had more emphasis on cyclists than it did on the pedestrian. These phones are in people's in people's faces, and at some point, I mean people are more and more people are going to get hit because I mean even this morning that there must have been 30 or 40 in a clear do not walk point that are going through across Iowa. The other side of it is, and I know that there's a cost to it, is one of the next things was here, if I'm not mistaken, and if you ever go to a baseball game, the same concern is there. If there's not a, a, over, uh, a bridge over Nicholson, there's going to be significant injuries in the future. What, what, what every traffic consultant we've looked at has told us across the board, 100%. You can build it, they will not come. <laughs> if, if a student is not going to take 
two seconds at the crosswalk to look up from their phone and say, let me make sure I don't get run over. They're not going to be willing to walk up those steps across and down. If you look at the timing, uh, 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 yeah, we, we had a complaint from a parent the other day about timing at one of the lights uh, here, here at Nicholson, the crossing. And uh, so we sent a crew out and said, let's let we have, you know, within about half an hour of getting that complaint, we had a crew out there watching the light, videotaping the light, and there was ample time. The, the complaint from the parent was, my kid didn't have enough time to walk all the way across. If you start walking when the light first turns white and says cross, you, there's plenty of time. If you're looking at your phone, don't notice the lights turn white until right before it starts blinking. That is true. You do not have enough time. So uh, a lot of that's going to come down to, to education. We do feel that Nicholson, uh, that we, we actually, let me, as we were working on this Nicholson Gateway development, there was a lot of concern about whether this was increasing pedestrian traffic across Nicholson and whatnot. The reality is this was all commuter parking uh, uh, beforehand. And so we are, uh, in fact, we believe we have uh, reduced the number of people, the number of students actually crossing Nicholson on a daily basis uh, by building this development because we've, we, we, we've shifted a lot of students who work commuter students to living here. And so there's been a lot more time on campus and generally crossing roads um, less. Or else we, we, we take it very seriously and, and we look at it literally almost every single day. The, the studies show that the only way that pedestrians will use a, a walkway above a roadway is if there's no other way for them to get from one side to the other. <laughs> and so that would mean us fencing off a hall of Nicholson and both sides of Highland Road, so th and that's just not going to work. So, yes, Judith. Okay, well, first of all, on the traffic thing. <laughs> I come in on um, on Highland and then I, I turn on, uh, I never know what it is, Stadium Drive on that direction anyway. Um, I don't remember the name. Dial Ripple, you know. I've been living on this campus my whole life. I don't remember the name. And there are two intersections that I have to go through where cars are allowed to park right on either side of that crosswalk. And if the students are coming from those dorms, I cannot see them until they are physically in that crosswalk. Okay. So, and the buses in front of the journalism building are parking over the crosswalk that for some reason got moved from in front of Hodges to in closer to the journalism building where the buses now are constantly parked over that. Right. And if you're in a wheelchair, there is no safe way to cross that. There you go. So I, I want to say that. Okay. But the other thing <laughs> is if you happened to watch NBC Nightly News last night. They did an entire segment about the dangers of the e-cigarettes exploding. And uh, it, there was, they had very graphic video from not just one, but several of these, uh, and it showed the burns and all of that. And in fact, this last summer, there was a man in Florida who was killed when he was vaping and his e-cigarette exploded and it sent a projectile into his brain. Yeah, instantly. I have contacted the Risk Management Committee twice in the last two years, regularly. I've sent them video. I've said, what are we doing about this? Because we got rid of the lithium batteries, hoverboards. They were instantly taken off. Nobody's done anything about the e-cigarettes. And they're going into classrooms increasingly. They're in the laboratories. We've always had trouble with people smoking on the loading, loading docks for the buildings they have these chemicals. Well, and nobody seems to I, deal with it. Judith, as you know from when we co-chaired the, 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 mm -hmm. the, the committee that ended tobacco and e-cigarette usage on this campus, right. it was against policy. Um, there, there is an enforcement issue component to that. Unfortunately, facility and property oversight has nothing to do with enforcement. Uh, of, of, of that. So who um, does? That is my question. Who does? That question should have been addressed to the gentleman who was sitting to your left. <laughs> <laughs> oh, don't think I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> but you've got tenure here, not you. <laughs> uh, in answer to Judith's question, I'll talk a little bit about the ongoing search for a associate vice president for public safety. 
and the open forums that we'll have and the interviews that the faculty senate executive committee will will go into. So we'll talk about that a little bit more, Patrick. Let you know. Yes, Vince. Um, Michael, you mentioned that rad safety is sort of slightly different in the way it's organized into the H and S. Can you tell us? Yeah, they just, uh, we report to different uh, units. We're not in the same department. Uh, there's a director of radiation safety, and I'm director of environmental health and safety. So it's just separate, and it's, um, I know it seems odd, but it goes back years ago when uh, radiation safety was a, a system, I don't know what I'm supposed to say system anymore, a system function, uh, and uh, then it kind of more more uh, over at uh, nuclear science and it was more tied to academics and research uh, so it's just it was just kept that way over the course of the years so I can only say that that is just kind of evolved into that relationship uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Wei Sun Wang and I work together every day on, on health and safety issues I sit on the RAD safety committee he sits on the research safety committee so we certainly work close together uh, on all of these issues we just have different reporting lines and uh, have separate budgets and separate staff and what have you. So, uh, and it's just a, a vestige of an old setup that hasn't been changed over the course of years. From the 40s and 50s. Quite <laughs> yeah, literally. We are yoked to our history. <laughs> yes, Kyla. Hi, I represent the School of Theater. We have labs that I'm sure are small in comparison to other labs on campus, but we produce also a relatively small amount of hazardous waste, yeah. like spray paint and batteries. Mm -hmm. How can we go about disposing those properly? You just uh, contact our office uh, and H&S, uh, 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 we have our own website, uh, and I'll make sure somebody uh, contacts you. We do collect waste from the arts, uh, <coughs> uh, so it could be an area that we're uh, not hitting for one reason or another, I'm or there's been a change. Yeah, we can collect all that material. Great, so thank you. Yeah. Again, we probably should have mentioned while he was here that the environmental health and safety staff is actually pretty small to cover everything they do with all the inspections, picking up hazardous waste and everything. He operates with a really small staff that does pretty efficient things. We, we can all claim, complain about various staff departments not being responsive. Uh, I think that with all the things that they have to do, this is probably as responsible as any in addressing things on a timely basis. So I, 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 I've i lessened my complaints over the years well, well, thank you. based upon the number of staff that he really probably could use four or five That's times more staff. No, it's good to hear. Right, thank Patrick? You. <laughs> <laughs> we, we have 10 professionals uh, on staff uh, compared to, say, University of Florida, we probably have 70. Uh, and, uh, but when I started here, we had two. So we are leaps and bounds from when I started here uh, 29 years ago. So uh, we do the job we have to do. You didn't mention anything about cryogenic systems, would you? Uh, certainly those are part of uh, uh, our hazardous materials program. So compressed gases do have uh, liquid nitrogen training uh, as part of our training process. So if a task, uh, our lab is, uh, the personnel is identified through our chemical safety program as having, uh, we have a matrix that identifies the training you require to have. Um, we have that training available for those uh, faculty and grad students and students that work what about nuclear heating? Uh, that would probably fall, I mean, that would be fairly rare on campus, uh, probably in because physics or what have you. Uh, we're aware where we have those uh, systems, and if you have any particular concerns, we can certainly address those. Well. well, the reason I raised that issue is because a few years ago at the uh, University of Rhode Island, they had a graduate student who had his arm blown off and uh, a faculty member that was very seriously injured because that cryogenic system exploded. Sure because of the difference between the liquid nitrogen temperatures and the liquid heat. Right. It's, um, the cryogenics, uh, compressed gases, are serious safety issues. Uh, and our programs and training uh, inspection process, we, we do cover those issues on campus. Thank you. Andy? Well, I also have to commend you on an extraordinary job keeping us from injuring ourselves and each other, I guess. Um, and um, so, but my question has to do with, with progress comes construction. Construction is part of progress, and it's a dynamic situation, as was evident by the very interesting traffic flow of throughout the summer, um, which was actually, I think, handled really well. So, um, but what my question is, is 
you guys can't monitor everything. You can't be everywhere all the time. And things do happen with construction. So how do people go about, you know, and, and you said we, the one thing you don't hear about are near misses. So I think people don't want to feel like they're complaining or something, but still, yeah, how do they me. We would love for all of our programs uh, to be proactive and catch everything before it happens, but we certainly are very reactive as well. Uh, when we do construction and renovations uh, on campus, it'd be great if the building could be closed, they could do the renovation and move back in. But we have to do, unfortunately, renovations on occupied buildings. This presents a problem. Noise, construction, dust, uh, vapors and fumes and odors and smells inconveniences uh, and over the course of long renovations that gets to be quite frankly a pain mm -hmm. uh, and we uh, are called in often and will help to facilitate corrections as they're needed we work closely with uh, roger husser's group of uh, facility uh, development um, i'm sorry that's the old name <laughs> uh, facility planning design uh, and construction uh, and uh, we work closely with the contractors to correct issues that happen we have uh, pre-bid and pre-construction meetings, which we are at, which we try to head off and get all those issues before they start. Um, and we're going to be as responsive as we can be to those that happen. Uh, the Bev School has had so much construction in the last several months, and uh, there have been issues there, of course, that we've worked on. But the, they do occur, and we try to be responsive as we can. If you have a complaint, don't sit in your office and be exposed to dust or fume or vapors, or give us a call. And, uh, we will come out, we, if, uh, we will monitor uh, for issues if we don't notice the issue we will, uh, and look into that over the course of time and uh, we're on your side in that, in that fight and we're going to work to correct the actions. Absolutely. Let me, let me add, let me sure. add that, if I may. Um, this is also an area where the, where, where the faculty center is very beneficial to help channel communications. You know, of course, Dr. Lopez is very well aware of, a, uh, of an odor issue, a severe odor issue uh, caused at the School of uh, Veterinary Medicine um, uh, during a recent construction uh, project. And, and because she's an officer of the faculty center, we're like, okay, hey, everybody, let's go take care of this. But the reality is we would move that quickly for each and every one of you you don't know to call me or to call Michael necessarily. We're telling you now, call Michael, call me. Uh, but also uh, call one of your faculty senate representatives, uh, uh, officers, uh, or and encourage your faculty to call y'all to tell you to tell to tell all the faculty out there how to get something like that um, addressed. You know, there there are unpleasant realities. There are smells associated with construction. Uh, sometimes they reach so bad that, that and, and, and our contractor does an ina inadequate job. Uh, of addressing them, uh, but we want them addressed. We want, uh, we don't want to expose our faculty uh, and staff and students to any, anything like that uh, that we should. So uh, please reach out through those channels. Call us directly anytime uh, to take care of that. And that's one of the things that we're trying to do with faculty governments, particularly with the faculty senate, is to alert you to things that we might not think of on a normal basis, but if we have a successful capital campaign and we continue to have stable budgets, then we will have more renovations and remodeling on campus, which will cause these unexpected situations, and you need to know how to handle those. So and that's part of the reason why we have so many guest speakers come in is so that we are aware of what's going on on campus so that we can forestall things before they actually might happen. And part of the change that we're adopting in, 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 in light of the concerns that Dr. Lopez had brought to us is improving our communications before construction projects uh, go on. Uh, the vast majority of our construction projects um, that affect buildings on campus, if they're, if they're smaller in scope, we do our utmost best to squeeze them into the summer months because that minimizes the impact on both faculty and students. Um, and and you know, we can't always, sometimes it's a year round, you know, it takes a year, eight months or whatever, so we can't squeeze into the summer. We do try to squeeze into the summer when we can. Uh, but we're also going to, in the future, um, uh, be rolling out over the next couple of months uh, better communication. So when there is going to be um, a new floor put down that, that requires a very smelly uh, adhesive or something like that, or there's going to be excessive amount of noise or dust that we anticipate from, from the construction, we're going to be making sure everybody in the building gets an email saying what the construction is, 
uh, what time period is going to be taking place over, and, and providing guidance to uh, to supervisors in the building if there is a. Uh, say a pregnant woman who is particularly sensitive to uh, to those odors, what's the appropriate way of handling that um, uh, to provide an alternate workspace or work from home that day or what have you, um, so that the employee uh, is not left to, to fend for themselves dealing with this unpleasant work environment. And one of those aspects that we're all working towards is every building theoretically has a safety coordinator a building coordinator who's responsible for reporting unsafe incidences, happenings, whatever, that's not always obvious to the people in the building now that we have hired so many new faculty members. So that's one of the things that Michael and Patrick will be working on with their staff is how do we get that message across so that everybody understands who is the responsible person for that building. Juan, you had a question? No, no, it's been addressed. Thank you. Okay. And I'll also add to that quickly, um, I have some cards here, I'll take them in the meeting. Uh, I'm on call 24-7 LSU, I'm not telling them to call LSU police all the time, but they <laughs> will call me out, or you can call me out, and I'm going to come out or call one of my staff out, and we're going to take every situation uh, night and day, uh, because it's, uh, you're, again, you're, you have the basic right to have a safe and healthy workplace, and you're going to work through that. Question, yes. Uh, yes, going back to the issue of smoking on campus, what are we supposed to do? I have um, on various occasions witnessed people smoking when I'm going to class and back and forth. What are we supposed to do if we witness somebody smoking? I, I don't like to give this answer, but it, it, it's not that my department. Uh, I, 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 there, there is unfortunately no uh, campus-wide enforcement mechanism uh, for violations of the smoking policy, as, as Dr. Sylvester can, can tell you to her great frustration. Um, and, and so, um, uh, stepping back out of my current role, back into, you know, three, when was that, three years ago? Four? August 2014. All right, so four years ago, <laughs> when I was co-chair of the, uh, of the, of the uh, committee that uh, recommended to the president the, the no uh, smoking, no tobacco, uh, policy, uh, there was a lot of discussion about enforcement. Do you call the dean of students' office? The LSU police will not enforce it because it's simply a policy. It's not a law. So the LSU police will not enforce it. Um, I would suggest that, that um, the, the, the most appropriate report, place to report uh, a student violating the policy would be to the dean of students' office. Um, and that if an employee of the institution uh, is you, you see them smoking, report them to their supervisor or their department. So if you see uh, a custodian smoking, you know, call somebody in facility property oversight, call me, call Michael, we'll, we'll, we'll get to the right person, and we will take steps as supervisors to say, hey, cut that out. Um, that's, the best, that's the best thing I can tell you to do. I will be talking with, to the student government on the 5th of September, I believe, their responsibility or lack thereof will be high on the list of things that I talk to them about in our campus community. Obviously, traffic and their awareness of that and their health aspects of not just because it's a policy, but because there's long-term health detriments to vaping. I mean, that's fairly well proven. Vaping, smoking, tobacco use of any kind, etc. And I guess as a former smoker, I can tell them not to do it as well as anybody. <laughs> so, yes. And if you are, please quit. It's for your own benefit. Really? Yeah, I know this has gone quite a, a long way, so I'm sorry to have one more comment. But um, sometimes I'm feeling like I'm living in an alternate universe. Um, that I love these policies, and that you're, we're all looking out for the best interest of all. And, good stewards to the environment, I hope. That was one thing I was curious about, like how are we with the environment? Are we just containing these things? Or is LSU actually a conscious, you know, player in the larger scope of things? That's not even my question. <laughs> 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 because I, you know, all of us, myself, we could all be better, right? Um, 
some social. Are you looking at no. our waste disposal, or are you yeah, looking I, I mean, at there, our sustainability? I have sustainability so many questions, efforts? and I don't want to just make this my, you know, my talk show or anything. But um, I, I work in a very old building. It's been on the, um, the list, like a lot of us that work in old buildings, I think. Um, it, it's it's been cited as a very dangerous, hazardous building. I'm not really concerned about that for, for me. Um, I like old things. I like to work on them. I have this best decided house, all kinds of stuff. So, um, but I don't know if it's, is it really true that when there's construction going on, people tell us that there's risks and that, or did I just not get certain numbers? I, I, can, I don't want I to can answer them. for these two but guys. Me, I have never the very been, first thing when there's a remodeling is project that, wait, can you is an ex, asbestos expert is brought in to determine do we have to abate? And if we have to abate, that's what drives up that, well, yeah, that's why we haven't matter. had it's as many remodeling projects as normal because every building is filled with asbestos if it was built 20 or so years ago. It's perfectly safe as long as it hasn't been down. disturbed. What? The, asbestos, the stuff that there's a lot of asbestos in this building, I didn't want anybody to freak out. There's asbestos everywhere. Right. If it's older It's than okay, it, yeah. as long as it doesn't get Disturbed. Well, again, we, we work. But it's not true that you're not, we're not working on buildings that are already old and have been viewed as problematic or. No, well, right? uh, so. I'm not sure. Uh, I think I'm going to try to answer your question. Okay. I'm not sure of the question. As far as getting information down to all the building occupants, that's something we try to do through the building coordinator and the different departments as to Who here's upcoming that? construction and what I've happens. Never heard of but one. that's one of the things is that we're. That's that every building has a building coordinator, but that's one of the changes that we that we are in the process of adopting after the the vet med uh, uh, issues uh, this this uh, this summer is that that communication has not always been getting through from the building coordinator to the building occupants. So now our office of planning, design, and construction, which is responsible for overseeing thousands upon thousands every year of renovations, large and small, across campus, is now going to be taking the lead and making sure that that email uh, notifying you of that gets out to every every building occupant. We're not going to be relying on the building coordinator, who is usually a, a business manager or an administrative assistant or somebody like that. Um, it, it's now going to be handled by, uh, by our office to make sure that that communication goes out. Okay and goes out to everybody. If you have any specific questions about a specific building, let me know. Uh, I've been on top of or under pretty much every building on campus. So uh, <laughs> if you have any questions, you know, let me know. We'll talk about it. He and his staff are in my building out a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Our building is actually Anything good. else? Yeah, you know, I would like to make one quick comment about, about, about parking and the risk of opening myself up to our parking questions. I don't want to do that. But, <laughs> but um, uh, some of you may be aware that there uh, that we have made a new B lot available uh, on the corner of West State Street. All right. Um, the, where, where, for those of you who have been around here a long time, it's where the old McDonald's used to be. Uh, it's a little bit, uh, we're trying something a little bit different. That lot has previously been um, uh, been used to, for, for pay parking. It was owned by a private party until about a year ago when LSU acquired it. So now what we're trying is, is a little bit of an experiment. It's uh, pay parking at night and LSU be parking during the day. Now if you're working late till 7 o'clock at night or something like that, they're not going to ticket you or tow you or charge you a fine or anything like that. We've worked that out. Um, but uh, but there's a lot of students and folks come and go to parties at the varsity and go drinking at the chimes and whatnot. And, and, and we're hoping to get a little money. Uh, uh, from that to help defray the university's problems. It's not much, but it's an experiment. We, we look forward to hearing feedback from that. Uh, another experiment is uh, the parking garage here on Nicholson Gateway. Uh, this year, uh, and we're going to evaluate this for next year, but this year the top floor is going to be B parking as well as residential parking. So the parking garage here generally is mixed residential uh, and, 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 I mean, it's for residential students, it's zone residential, uh, but the top floor is going to be uh, zone residential slash B parking. So B permits are welcome to park at the top of the parking garage. Um, um, you know, if you're working over here, or if you've got to come over here for a meeting or something like that, and there's no place else to park, you can do that. 
Um, I want to second what Dr. Alexander said about uh, encouraging you to consider shopping at Mathern's Grocery. Uh, it's, it's open to, to everybody. Uh, Ernie Mathern was just telling me yesterday he hadn't seen very many faculty or staff in there yet, and he would really like to, to see some. We think it's going to be very convenient for a lot of us to go in and out of uh, on our way home uh, or, or whatnot. It's a full service uh, grocery store, very similar to their one downtown. I think you'll find that very uh, attractive. Uh, and finally, on parking related to the to the retail, um, the rules for the retail parking, and we're going to be posting more clear signs about this in the near future. In these, in the in the two lots that are that are designated as retail parking lots, there's a there's a pretty sharp one hour time limit for parking there. Doesn't matter. You don't need a permit. Doesn't matter what your permit is. Um, it's one hour uh, to park there. That's that's designed to make sure that our student, our commuter students and whatnot, don't just clog up the lot because we need to keep those lots um, uh, available for people who are actually going to shop uh, at, the, at the stores. There will be a process once we uh, have uh, the sit-down restaurants, the two sit-down restaurants that are, that are gonna, not going to be open for quite a few months yet. Once they open, there will be a way if you're, if you're having a longer lunch or, or something like that um, that you can have a little more time. And like all parking on campus, those will stop applying after you know, 4, 4, 4 30. Um, Anything else? Yes, yes. Since you brought up parking. Uh, <laughs> here, 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 here. No good to get something. There's been plans for about six years, as near as I like can tell, to take some of the parking off Gallery and replace it with a bike path that connects to the lake's bike path. What's, what's the status of that? Uh, I do not know the answer to that question, but I'd be happy to, to, to look at that. That would be a question for our new director of campus planning, Greg LeCur. Yep. Yes. I personally, I would dearly love it. But, yeah. All right. Thank you very much. Thank, Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So I welcome our new senators. And I've got a few other things, actually probably more than you want to listen to, but that's okay. One of the first things I want to do is to recognize our new faculty senate coordinator, Susanna. Wave your hand, Susanna. <laughs> um, I don't know what to say about her is, I'm not sure there's anything she can't do. Because everything that we've asked her to do so far, arrangements, you notice that we have coffee and water now. <laughs> uh, once we figure out what our faculty senate budgets are, we might have more than that at the next few meetings. but. Uh, we're trying to figure out what our exact budgets are, so we are moving forward. Part of that is that she has spent lots of time revising our Faculty Senate website. As soon as we have all of the rest of the uh, new senators online and we're waiting for co the Colleges of Science, uh, Law Center, and Music and Dramatic Arts, I believe, then we'll roll out the new website. Uh, what we want to do is several things. Now that we have a coordinator, we want to have more of what we call faculty-oriented, and I'm, I'm going to use the term seminars, workshops, whatever, because we've kind of neglected faculty development for, gosh, 38 years. And so in that regard, now that we have a coordinator who is equipped uh, as a central housing type uh, base, then we can have more of those seminars. One of the goals is, where are we going to do this? The foundation is very gracious to let us use this room, the boardroom, or some of the other conference rooms on uh, other floors. But realistically, if we're really going to promote faculty development for that almost 300 new faculty we've hired in the last two years, we need a dedicated space. And so we're trying to work with finance and administration. Uh, we bring that up about every meeting when we meet with uh, Vice President Lazelle and also with academic affairs. Uh, and since Dr. Cassidy is here and she coordinates some of the space utilization, we'll also be working with uh, our new director of campus planning, as I said, Greg LeCur. So what we're trying to do is to make the faculty senate a focal point for not only faculty governance but for 
anything that a faculty needs to do as a one-stop shop. So you'll see on the Faculty Senate website, all of a sudden there will be things that you'll say, whoa, I didn't know I could find that here or find directions on how to get to where you need to go. So along with the employee hub that's now on the LSU website, we want to make the Faculty Senate website much more, I guess, faculty user friendly. And so that's one of our goals. So as we roll it out, when you've got suggestions, if you say this is missing information, <coughs> this is how it can be better, Susanna at facultysenate.com at lsu.edu is the person that uh, will be our contact person. So I'm not going to say any more accolades about her. I don't want to get her to get a swell head, but <laughs> she is doing lots for us uh, in the background. Search committees. A lot of search committees going on. Search committee for registrar is having interviews today and on Friday and the two candidates are highly qualified. One's an internal candidate, one's an external candidate, and so the faculty senate executive committee is participating in those interviews. Uh, they decided not to have public forums, which aggravates me quite a bit, quite honestly, because any of those positions need to be highly visible on campus. Uh, we've been assured that the search committee for provost, and, I am, and I'm on that search committee along with six other faculty members. So faculty comprise half of the executive vice president and provost search committee. And so, again, I, I was remiss in not commending Dr. Alexander on assembling that search committee, but there will be ample opportunity for all of us to participate in that search process. In that regard, if you know an administrator, whether it's here on campus or off campus, that you think would be a good provost, and realistically, the executive committee did meet with Dr. Alexander earlier in the week and express the traits that we really want in a provost, and we told him flat out, we want a provost like Dr. Kubek without any of Dr. Kubek's faults or idiosyncrasies. <laughs> and so if we can find an individual like that, we'll continue to move forward. Yes, some of you did catch the humor in my comment. But realistically, we have a strategic plan in place, and some of us are very adamant that we were all involved in some aspects and, and pieces of assembling that strategic plan, we're not about to let that strategic plan be like all of our previous strategic plans that, oh, it looks good on paper, but it doesn't have any teeth or any action to it. No, we, we've got lots of things that we can do, probably not all of them, but there are things that are going to move <clears throat> LSU forward. So we're looking for a provost who, one, has institutional advancement and a proven record of that as well as all the other traits that we look for and somebody who's going to look over all the campuses as well as our own campus. Um, Associate Vice President for Public Safety. Those interviews will be uh, September 10th, 17th, and 24th. Again, the Executive Committee will be a part of the interview process for those candidates. The other aspect, and I've been both assured that it will happen and told, no, we haven't planned on it, is for the public forums. So I, again, I will stress very diligently that this is a high level position and the campus needs to be aware that we're looking for somebody to look out over all the aspects of campus safety or public safety. Uh, they'll interface very closely, one would hope, with Michael's uh, office with risk management and with the police department and all of the things that go into public safety, parking and traffic. And so in that regard, we need to kind of have a campus approach to what, uh, which of the three uh, candidates is actually recommended. The vice president for strategic communications, some of you are aware that we had a search two years ago for that position and none of the candidates were deemed accept acceptable for us to move LSU forward at that time. My understanding is that 
they are looking at a couple of consulting firms to come in and visit with uh, various aspects of campus, including faculty governance, and for us to make recommendations then to that consulting group on what traits we're looking for, what we actually need for strategic communications, and then they will write a job description for us so that then we can go out for a vice president uh, for strategic communications. Um, I'll accept any questions on that. Most of us realize that both our internal as well as our message to the to the our community at large uh, could use lots of work. And so in that regard, if we have a centralized place and some more degree of control and uh, presence on that would be very much appreciated. I've got down wording changes in PS50. Uh, when one deals like the executive committee does with various administrative and, and uh, organizational units on campus, then you find out that most of our policies have flaws. They either miss something, there are hidden loopholes that can be uh, found by a very astute reader and some of them are just plain worded uh, erroneously. So I suggested two wording changes in PS50. Dr. Alexander is ready to sign off on those after they've been vetted through the process. One is that in one clause for a department chair or head being appointed or reappointed, the dean did have to consult with the faculty. The way that that sentence was written, they could dismiss a department head or chair without consulting the faculty. Hopefully that loophole has been closed so that whenever any decisions by a dean regarding a department head or chair or head are made, they have to consult with the faculty of that unit, which is, in my mind, only right and the right thing to do. The other aspect of PS50 uh, has to do with some of the uh, ways that deans do their job and department heads do their job. And most of us are aware that all of a sudden we have a staff person or a fellow faculty member who is overseeing our financial affairs, either direct budget oversight or they have influence. And so that is also a change where any faculty member or any staff member who has oversight of budgets of any other faculty member, they have to go through the advertising process instead of just being named. Again, that opens up for lots of people to be uh, in that, regarded for that particular position rather than a pet or a favorite being named to that position. So those are two of the things that, that uh, Dr. Alexander has agreed will, again, make our PS50 a little bit more concise and a little bit more uh, understandable. Committees. We're going to talk about restructuring of some of our committees uh, later when, under new business. We are looking for volunteers for several of our non-elected committees. So if you're interested in serving on any faculty senate committee, uh, whether it be budget and planning, which is an elected committee, whether it be courses and curriculum, which uh, is a little, we, requires a little bit of experience at the departmental level and college level before you can actually be named to the university committee. But any of the committees that we have uh, that are faculty senate committees, mission standards and honors, contact Dr. Baumgartner. She's our chair of committee on committees. If you want to serve on the Committee on Committees, which solicits nominees for all of our candidates for all the committee positions, again, we're looking for different uh, college representatives for those. I'm also looking for a faculty liaisons with the Staff Senate and Student Government. We have a couple of staff uh, liaisons who are attending each of our meetings so that we have improved relations as far as governance uh, both by the staff and by the faculty 
bodies, and so I'm looking for a couple of representatives, and if you wouldn't have to attend every meeting, but if you could attend some of those meetings, uh, as you'll see in a minute, I normally attend all of their meetings except some of them meet on a weekly basis and my schedule's just flat out too full. So if you'd like to participate in that, send me an email, see me after, and uh, I'm looking for liaisons in that regard. So that brings us to meetings. This is, I haven't listed every single meeting, but just to show you that the executive committee and I, we interface with a lot of different people on campus, not every day, but on a regular basis. Uh, one of the things that is ongoing is Service and Operational Excellence Committee. That's a campus-wide committee. Dr. Cassidy uh, is the academic representative. Tyler Kearney is the finance and administration uh, committee co-chair. And what we're trying to do is to facilitate service by both our staff and impart some of the responsibilities that we think faculty should have in helping make the, our <coughs> LSU community a better place. Dr. Cassidy talked about some of those things that Dr. Haney and I have discussed, <coughs> midterm grades, posting of grades on Moodle so students know where they stand at any point in time. Those are some <coughs> of the things that we're going to try and impress upon faculty that, yes, that improves morale, it helps our students to be more successful, and it generates a much better university in the long run. So we'll be talking about those things. Uh, I've got a couple of uh, education faculty members who are agreeing to serve as trainers, so we're developing the curricula, and we'll be rolling that out either later this fall or early next spring. Uh, as you're, most of you are well aware, Dr. Haney decided to uh, suspend for a short time the Vice Provost for Graduate Studies and Global Engagement Search. And so in that regard, we're trying to get the graduate school back on track as far as the processes and procedures and efficiencies. Cope, our past president, and I have met with Dr. Richardson, who's the interim dean of the graduate school, and he is fully aware of our expectations and the priorities that we have to, one, continue some of the operational efficiencies that Dr. Macias got started, but also then to move those forward so that as we have a new graduate admission uh, process, actually a software program that is fully implemented and vetted, and we don't have the dreaded software program, the word, I won't use the word that we all hate to hear, but. Uh, we don't have those kind of difficulties again. Uh, the Greek Affairs Implementation Committee, again, I was served on that. Uh, and some of those things are being highly implemented right now. Most of you who have heard the news, we <coughs> suspended a fraternity uh, just this week because of infractions of the new policies and procedures that were set into place. So there's no monkey business now. They either hold to as individuals and as chapters, or they don't operate here at LSU. And so I think partially they got set as an example, but realistically, it's always hard being the first ones. But if you can't toe the line, if you can't behave the way that we expect our Greek organizations and realistically all student organizations on campus too, then you're going to suffer the penalties and price. Um, past President Cope and Vice President Lopez and I meet on a regular basis with finance and administration personnel. Part of those have to do with uh, occasionally Michael's agency. Part of the time with what Patrick does, a lot of the time it's with procurement, and almost every meeting we have to talk about shorts travel. And <laughs> realistically, shorts travel, if you have a difficulty, go to the APIC website, the Administrative Process Improvement Committee website, and file 
the data so we can get so eventually we don't have to deal with them anymore. <laughs> There's also a survey that they have. Fill out the survey and express your dissatisfaction with them if indeed you are. I would hope that any of you who traveled this summer on university business did not have any of the same difficulties that I had or that Dr. Sylvester has had yet this week. Otherwise, I don't know how to express my sympathy enough for you. Okay? So, please please document when you've got difficulties in arranging university travel. The more evidence we have, the more better case we can make with finance and administration so they can go downtown. This is a state travel agency. But I can't imagine that any agencies have more travelers who have to go through shorts than LSU does. So in that regard, we want to exert our muscle but you've got to have data in order to prove that they're not providing the services that are being contracted for. Um, there will be a beta test. They're changing some of the ways that they do things. If you would like to participate, then again, shoot me an email. I'll get you on that faculty list. Uh, some of us are really eager to see what they can screw up next. <laughs> so if you want to participate, shoot me an email. I'll make sure you get on that list to participate in their beta test of whatever they're going to roll out now. Um, yes, Mandy's reminded me that you do pay additionally besides the contracted rate, you also pay for any extra service. So every time you go on the website, there's a two or five dollar charge and a telephone call I, I forgot to bring my tin cup so that we could actually collect money for Judith to pay for his, her telephone calls that she had because theoretically there's a $20, $25 charge. But, but I was able to do it online so I don't know yes. that much. Um, <laughs> anyway, that, that's enough about finance administration. Uh, Vice President for Student Affairs, I've met with Dr. Kepler several times. Uh, I will serve on the Campus Planning Search Committee and hopefully uh, Greg LeCur, who has more than 40 years of experience and wanted to come back to Louisiana. He actually was a principal of one of the largest worldwide architectural firms in the, in the world. And so in that regard, uh, when we saw his name pop up, it's like, wait a minute, is this too good to be true? Turns out it was not. So we have very high hopes for instituting the master plan under his direction because he's got experience both in architectural design as well as in planning spaces, parks, buildings, and interior uh, layouts. We will have the Senior Director of Annual Giving. She will come talk to us next month in September. Obviously, we're going to roll out our capital campaign, and so, again, faculty need to be involved because some of us know very wealthy alumni, some of us have uh, connections with potential donors, and so we want to make sure that we're on the same page as the foundation uh, staff. We meet on an irregular basis, but with Dr. Cassidy and Dr. Lee, uh, our associate vice provost, we also meet with our new associate uh, vice provost, Dr. Thackerberry, and so, and I have yet to meet with Jose Avilas. He will come and speak to the Senate on our enrollment patterns and what we're actually doing as far as recruitment uh, efforts at our September meeting. Uh, met with campus federal executives. They want to fund and support some of our seminars and workshops that we're planning on having. <coughs> IT staff, we all know we don't operate with ITS. Uh, if you're doing anything on campus, Summit Jane will again come in September, and you're starting to see that we're going to have lots of guests come in September because lots of things are happening on campus. He's going to talk about the latest developments in clicker and clicker management on campus how we prevent student cheating and those type aspects. 
and then also uh, talk a little bit about some of the other things with ITS. There are always legal developments, there are always uh, other aspects about ITS. One of the things our understanding is that um, when we have off-campus access, some faculty are having difficulties with that and that they want to tighten up the security a little bit. In October, then we'll have Tom Glenn come talk to us about student modernization. So again, faculty uh, executive committee, we deal with IT on many different levels. Commencement activities committee, uh, that will meet the faculty senate president, faculty, uh, excuse me, staff senate president, student body, uh, student government president, um, registrar, our interim registrar, and president's representative. We will meet those of you who have participated in commencement. On the one hand, we do it. On the other hand, it's probably not what we really want. And so we'll be looking and I'm receptive to any ideas you have on improving. One of the things is, should we have every graduate at a single ceremony or should we continue with the college ceremonies we have now? Either direction we go, we probably again need to do some different things so it's more meaningful to the participants. We have more attendance from the faculty of, excuse me, from the family and friends that come of the graduates and that is more meaningful for faculty. So hopefully what I will try to do is to set things up so that you'll want to come to commencement in May so that we have half of the floor of the assembly center filled with our half of our 1,350 faculty members because yes, you'll want to come and participate and be a part of that. So that's one of my goals is instead of only having the faculty who have PhD candidates and a few others that faculty really want to participate this in this because it's a culmination of our student success. So that's one of the goals is again to make it much more uh, inviting and more <coughs> useful to campus. On October 29th and 30th, the President will sponsor another symposium like he did last year on uh, movement or, or uh, moment, only this year it will be behind the ballot. That symposium is scheduled to do two or three things. One is we want to motivate the students so they become registered to vote and then they actually do participate in the voting process. Secondly, we want to educate the community on the issues that really affect their voting patterns and then influence how our legislators vote when they actually look at higher education. So some of you in political science, communication <coughs> studies, sociology, uh, ma mass communications, manship school, you'll be asked to participate. So if you haven't already, <coughs> then let me know. If you have anything to do with politics, if you have anything to do with elections, if you have anything to do with how our legislative and really elected election process proceeds, let me know because we're looking for the faculty expertise to actually showcase at this symposium as well as bring in a speaker. Uh, I was amazed this morning at our meeting if we get the outside speaker that we want, we'll probably have to have it in PMAC. So we'll see what happens with that. Uh, question, Vince? I think they have to register 20 days before the election, and this is in that window. And that's not going to cut it. Yes, so there's going, there's two different uh, student groups on campus, and so in that regard, once we finalize some of the initial uh, offerings. We're trying to get, as one of the culminating events, is to have our manship visiting <coughs> professor and his politically oriented to the opposite side wife to actually come and have a debate on how the various parties look at voters type thing and if we get them confirmed along with this other speaker, then 
those advertisements will go out and then these two student organizations will really go after, yes, register to vote, whether it's in your home parish or whether you've established residence here in, uh, on campus in Baton Rouge. So, yeah, it's, that's a good question, but, but they're trying to tie everything together. But if we have them too far ahead of the election, then those officials who are hoping to get elected, don't we lose sight of them and they lose sight of us. So, yeah, timing is everything. It may not be great timing, but we also can't schedule it around some of the other campus activities. Ali. I know starting October 10th, ITS will merge the uh, LSU main with my LSU, and you only have one password to access in both. In my opinion, this would create vulnerability, especially if we are traveling internationally, the access LSU mail with a password and my LSU is with a different password. And my LSU is really very sensitive. Uh, so that would Jane, everything. Some of Jane will come and talk to us about that, yes. Yes. Scheduled for next month. In fact, I've got to meet with him this next week to do that. Send them an email about that. I've already sent yeah. them an email about that. The more people who, who send them that are concerned about that, the so more right. yes. I've already complained. Yes. Yeah, okay. that research. Um, Obviously, we interviewed several candidates for our coordinator position. Uh, Dr. King, Dr. Alexander talked about the executive vice president and provost search committee. Uh, we've already met. Mark Batzer is one of our Boyd professors, is chairing that committee, and I've already mentioned that uh, half of the committee is composed of faculty at various levels, assistant, a few associate and mostly full faculty members, uh, as well as a couple of deans. We've got the past uh, chair of the board of directors of the foundation who is an outside member on the committee. So uh, it looks like it will be a fairly good committee that's not bashful about asking hard questions of, of the candidates. But again, we need your help to solicit the best candidates. The executive committee has met and a couple of other faculty have met several times about Faculty 360. I don't want to say too much more except you either like it or you don't hear, want to hear those words ever, ever, ever again. And so we're trying to meld those together. We've heard rumors and I haven't been able to confirm that 360 is going away in favor of something else. Well, we have to have something because we live in an electronic and digital age and so in that regard, uh, one of the things that ITS is fully aware of is with Faculty 360, it doesn't import data easily from other formats and so we're trying to work, uh, again, RM has been a, I won't say the chief complainer, but, no. but he has carried a lot of our complaints to ITS, uh, it's been to some workshops, and they're fully aware of the difficulties that we have. So we're working on that. Those of you who suffered through, some of you who received complaints from your department head or your dean that you didn't do it right, sorry, this is just the growing pains of us moving into the digital uh, age as far as faculty evaluations. Uh, I've mentioned most of the things that we'll have for our faculty uh, Senate meeting next month on the 20th, so mark your calendar for that. Uh, along with the other speakers, we'll also have a Summer Steve to talk to us about the University Council on Gender Equity. So any questions then on my report? Uh, I actually do have a few other things. Uh, now that we have a faculty senate coordinator, we've decided that to relieve Dr. King as our secretary of some of the onerous tasks we'll have they have the translate what I would call abbreviated official set of minutes, but we will have a transcript of the video. So that way you won't have to wait through 12, 15, whatever pages of minutes to be refreshed on what did we talk about last month. But if you do want more details, then you'll be able to go to the transcript and sort through the details. So we're trying to make 
our minutes, one, more user friendly, and two, less onerous for our staff and uh, secretary to handle. So that's one of the changes that you'll see based upon our uh, discussion of this meeting. Second thing is we've got TRSL elections. If you're a TRSL member, not an ORP member, not an officer in retirement, but if you're actually in the teacher's retirement system, then there are many candidates for the university representative, at least two from the university, and I'm not gonna give uh, Dr. Davis a plug, but she's one of the candidates. So, Belinda, we appreciate you uh, stepping forward and saying, yes, this is important for the future of our retirement systems, and uh, if you're so obliged, at least vote so that somebody that we can trust and rely on is elected. Uh, the last thing I really want to discuss for my president's report is operational excellence training. The staff training has been fairly well uh, orchestrated and presented and it became very obvious to both academic affairs and finance and administration who had their staffs trained that this is fine for the staff, the bursar's office staff who have to deal with students, the registrar's office who deal with both faculty and administrators <coughs> and students, our custodial staff, our facility services people, Michael's people, yeah, that training is fine for them because they're providing a service. Their operations are important and we need to be as efficient and as concerned about resources and making sure things are done right. Faculty, we have a different orientation. So we're working on that training. What we want to try to do is not only things that we should be doing, like turning in midterm grades, um, making sure that our at-risk students are taken care of. When you see a student that has a difficulty and you say, oh, well, it's not my problem because it's not academic oriented. No, we're a campus community. See if we can help that student out because they have a life outside of their classrooms also. We also want to talk about academic freedom. We want to talk about due process. We want to talk about all those things that help us be better faculty members. So we're developing the uh, background for that now. We're discussing what kind of a format, whether it should be a training session uh, for different faculty or whether we should have it online how detailed it should be. We know that faculty don't really need to spend much more than an hour, hour and a half at the training, but what we want to do is to make it uh, engaging enough, interesting enough, so that once the first wave of faculty, and guess who the first wave of faculty trained will be? Tyler, who do you think? Us. Us. <laughs> so that we can tweak the system so that once we go back to our respective units and and implement some of the things that we've learned and may have forgotten, some of the things that will make our departments mm -hmm. better, then other faculty will say, wait, where, where did you get that training? How can I go to it? So that's the goal of training, is to make it engaging enough so everybody wants to participate rather than making it, well, I have to take the ethics training online, I have to do this, I have to do that. So that's our goal. Um, with that, I'll close and answer any questions so we can get to the next portion of our business meeting. As you can see, we've done a lot over the summer. Uh, there was no rest for the rest of our wicked crew on the executive committee. So the next thing on our agenda is we need to determine. I put vote. We can discuss, reach consensus. Um, now that we have a coordinator, we can do a few more things with our website, as I've said. Some departments have a picture of faculty along with the description. How far do you want us to go? We're going to post your name, we're going to post your department, your college, and when your term expires, you've already got a copy of, of where we're at so far. How much else should we post because you represent a constituency. What do y'all think?
Come on, Brooks, you've always got an opinion. <laughs> I mean, I, th I think it's true. Juan? Yeah, so I think it's, in terms of visibility uh, on campus, I mean, I, I don't know if you walk up to a student and say, hey, do you know who your you know, faculty senators are, or even other faculty members? Um, so I, I certainly, you know, I'm at the vet school, and unfortunately, like, a lot of these faces here are new to me, and I've been out here for about a year and change. Um, and so uh, having photographs, I don't think is such a bad idea. Increases visibility, and then kind of people get to know who's who. Put a literally a face to a name. Paul, we just, couldn't we just have a link to our faculty page? No, those are all options. That's why we're discussing right now is how can we move faculty <laughs> governance to a more uh, visible position without necessarily causing an unforeseen situation for any of our senators. <laughs> So that's a very distinct possibility, Paul. And is everybody satisfied with that? Is that there will be just another link to each person's personal web page or departmental website? I see a potential issue. I don't want to be ruining the part. What <clears throat> I mean, the three institutions, Cornell, UPenn, and Happy to Hill, that is a fantastic place. And even with the most efficient IT uh, personnel, often uh, websites are perennial working projects. Yeah. And a group, a dynamic group like ours, comprised of wonderful people, but there is pretty, pretty much a good turnaround of position, much more than you know, faculty position in the department. I foresee uh, the possibility of this being a continuous uh, working project. So if we want to do it, aspects, yes. if you want to do it, we want to make sure that things get changed promptly. Any yes. interruption? And, and I agree, and, and that's where my thought kind of came in. If the whole campus is now moved to digital measures, then I think that that's, that kind of supports the backdrop of what I'm mistaken for a lot of the college websites. And so if, from that perspective, it can be easily triggered in that same method, then I think it would be worth looking at. But otherwise, if, it, if it's going to become a, an administrative burden, then, then I think that, that creates issues. I'm not sure you understand how talented our native <laughs> is. It's not a burden whatsoever. <laughs> Let's have yes. a class picture. Let's have a class picture. There you go. This is our conference. You, know, you wanted some pictures, right? Yeah. Why not? Yeah, we would never get all lawyers, of course. But I, I'm perfect. not really being yeah. that facetious. <laughs> I think it'd be kind of fun. Mm -hmm. We'll start with the link, and then we'll take as around. we get more visible, then we'll make determinations along. So yeah, speaking of visibility, anyway. the second item then is if you've noticed, what? every student in student government has a student government shirt, either button-down t-shirt or otherwise. A lot of the staff now have LSU staff. Again, so the question is, do we want LSU faculty senate paraphernalia apparel for us? I think yes. Let's have embroidered polo shirts. I don't like the old ones. <laughs> if, if, if we have any interest at all, we will look into the possibilities and the potential costs. Uh, what, what are our options for apparel? What do you want, t-shirts? Probably. No, I hate t-shirts. I'll, I'll, I'll use that. I'll use that. Dreaded word. You know, Chanel. Whatever Star. strategic communications will let us do. <laughs> I take a because Gucci. if we're because technically we are part of the university, then we'll have to fit into the LSU brand, and so they will dictate kind of what we can and can't do. Okay, but I would think kind, kind of pay attention. As you see different staff people in student government, uh, students, they, they're all wearing the shirts. Now, that comes back to Fabio and Juan. <coughs> Maybe they don't want to be as highly visible at the vet school so everybody knows that they're their representatives to this body. Okay. They, they know. They know. 
<laughs> We're pretty vocal. Any other discussion on that? We'll, we'll have uh, our coordinator then investigate on those things. Uh, Dr. Gam Bim Van Gimmer was elected to be faculty senate um, executive committee member along with Dr. Sylvester, to two members at large, last spring. He has taken an associate dean position and so we need to elect a faculty senator to fill that position. We also traditionally reserve one of the three executive members at large positions to the new faculty members. So in that regard, we need to have elections. We also usually don't have a nominating committee because everybody knows their schedule and their own interests. So we take nominations from the floor, either nominations of another individual or self-nominations. So which election should we hold first? Knowing that technically we could elect two new senators to the position since they're now senators, or we could elect somebody who's been a senator for a year or two and then also a new one. So which election would you like to hold first? Hold the replacement first for Aaron. Joan? Let's hold the replacement for Aaron. We can do that first. Is that agreeable? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, do I hear nominations for executive member at large? Okay, we have a self-nomination from Fabio Pepero. Others? Nominate Ali. All right, Ali. Is the second? Fred is the third. Maybe I should, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put them up there in just a minute. Any others? You can self-nominate. Mandy, while I do that, would you like to pass out the balance? 